Hello, welcome back y'all to Storytime with me, Miss T, and our old mate, Mr. Gum. If your ears survived chapter 10 and you have in fact come back for more, thank you. I think you must be a much more brave soul than I. And as painful as it was for you to listen to, it was probably more painful for me to deliver. Not just the singing, but in fact, it turns out that I was having a mild allergic reaction to something the whole time I was videoing. Please don't go back and watch chapter 10. But if you did, you would see that throughout the video, my um, lips were doing crazy weird things. So by the end of it, I had this insane sort of joker effect going on. Um, the whole time I was reading and singing, it was like crazy stinging ants all kind of on my face. Fortunately, it affected mostly my mouth, not my airways so much. So that's good. I'm still here. Ready to do chapter 11, which is the heroes in the snow. So we've left the goblins, the goblin king, the burger wizard down the tunnel singing their terrible song. And we're back to the abandoned well with Friday and Polly. Can't wait to see what happens next. Hopefully, it's going to be interesting in all the right ways. Chapter 11, Heroes in the Snow. Polly and Friday lay at the bottom of the well in the darkest darkness they had ever not seen. The goblins were on their smelly way back to Lemonic Bibber and there was nothing they could do about it. I can't believe I missed the song, Friday said miserably. I bet it was magnificent. I bet you it wasn't, said Polly. No, Mr. Gum, it was probably full of mistakes and bourbon, what have you. Now, let's see what's going on round here, and maybe we can escape. Together they scrabbled about in the darkness, and soon their hands found something smooth and cold. It was the side of the old well. Maybe we can move these bricks, said Polly eagerly, and they set to work pulling and pushing at the stonework. But no, these bricks weren't going anywhere. They'd been there for hundreds of years, and they fancied being there hundreds of years more, and that was their final word on the matter. After a while, Polly collapsed back into the darkness. I ate it, she fumed. Mr. Gum just left us here to rot away like snowmen. And what's more... Just then, the bricks shifted a little. Then, out one popped on the floor. Magic bricks, said Friday, tapping his nose wisely. I thought as much. But for once in his life, Friday was wrong. A little face peeked out of the hole where the brick had been. Why, it's the rabbit, gasped Polly. And yes, it really was, because that rabbit had not forgotten Polly's kindness, and somehow it had known she was in trouble. So through the mountain it had burrowed, and those stupid bricks were no match for its powerful digging legs. Now follow me, the rabbit's green, bright green eyes seemed to say. And the travelers crawled through the burrow after the long-eared superhero. The passageway twisted and turned until Polly lost all track of time and Friday lost one of his shoes. But eventually, they saw moonlight shining up ahead. Sweet, sweet moonlight and out they climbed into the cold, starry night. Sweet, sweet moonlight, just occurred to me, is a line from The Highwaymen by Alfred Noyes. If you don't know that poem and you like ghost stories, it's a great ghost poem. Check it out. Anyway, sweet, sweet moonlight, out they climbed into the starry, cold, starry night. Thank you, little one, said Polly, bending down to shake the rabbit's paw. My work here is done, the rabbit's bright green eyes seemed to say. 
Now it is up to you, travelers. Only you can save the day with your bravery and courage. The way is hard, but I have faith in you because I am a rabbit. Wow, said Friday as the creature bounded off into the darkness. I've never met a rabbit with such talkative eyes. Never mind that, said Polly. We're still ages away from Lemonic Bibber and them goblins is going to beat us back there before we can warn the town folk. It really looked hopeless. But just then, Hark, said Friday. What sound is this coming our way in this blustery night? Why, it almost sounds like, yes it is. It's barking. Sorry, I had to pause. Eyes are getting tired. Could it be, said Polly, hardly daring to believe it was true. Could it be, she repeated, jumping on Friday's shoulders to get a better look. Yes, she cried it excitedly. Go! Number one hit record on the charts! Gold medal! Extra life! Brand new pencil case! You see, these were all the best things that Polly could think of, because rattling through the fields on his huge friendly paws was her old friend, Jake the dog. Love they, Jake the dog. I love Jake the dog. And what a fine, fine dog was he. There were sleigh bells all over his tail and an enormous Christmas tree stuck on his back. Do you reckon Jake got that out of Mrs. Wildsmith's house? I'd put money on it. And right at the top, like the star that he was, sat little Alan Taylor. There he is, look. Scanning the fields with his juicy raisin eyes. There they are! The biscuity fellow beamed when he saw the travelers. And as Jake came belting towards them, Polly laughed to see who was steering him, for it was a little boy, no older than she. Spirit of the rainbow! She laughed in pure joy. Is it really you? Let's see, let's see. There he is, look. Of course replied the lad as Jake pulled up and began licking Polly's eyebrows. I promised to come to your aid when the horn of Kazal Kazal was blown, and here I am. Thank you, sir, said Friday graciously, but there is one thing I have to ask. Couldn't you have come a bit sooner? Old man, replied the boy, when you blew that horn, I was in Newcastle, staying over at my cousin's. I had to catch the train, and it was delayed for ages. And then the taxi from the station broke down, so I had to walk the last two miles on foot. And then I had to... What? He asked, noticing Friday's surprise. You didn't think I would just magically appear when you blew the horn, did you? Oh! laughed the boy as the travelers climbed aboard Jake's festive back. The very idea. <gasps> you humans do amuse me. And then they were all laughing together for the idea of someone just magically appearing was simply ridiculous. But now there was no time to lose. Mush! cried the spirit of the rainbow, which is something you say to dogs to get them to run really fast through the snow. No one knows why. And Jake took off like a hairy bullet called Jake. And there they were, racing back to Lamonic Bibber in the moonlight. Alan Taylor, said Friday as they rode, how is my darling wife, Mrs. Lovely? Fine, thanks, chuckled Mrs. Lovely, popping her head out from inside the Christmas tree where she had been hiding for a surprise. I'm completely better now. Tra la 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 la! The truth is a lemon meringue! shouted Friday happily. Mrs. Lovely jumped into his arms and everyone pretended not to look while they'd done a bit of kissing in that. The rest of that night passed in a crazy, hazy days 
with Jake woofing and yaffling endlessly through the white, powdery snow. It was all down to that big bark machine now, and he ran like no dog has ever run before or since. Actually, one dog has run like that before. His name was Mop Mop, and it happened in Denmark in 1974. Mop Mop, Mop, Mop was chasing a florist through the streets of Copenhagen. Who cares about Mop Mop? cried Polly. Come on, Jakey, run! Had to stop the video then for a minute because somebody is uploading their work on the website. And it's Sunday night. It's kind of late. Come on. Be 11. Don't worry about work on a Sunday night. Be 11. Do armpit farts. Annoy your sister. You know, something like that. And put your feet up. Again, let's find out about Jake in the frozen fields. And so... Over the frozen fields, Big Jake ran, hardly even slipping on the icy bits. Through snowdrifts, great and small, bounding over walls, he left a country style and ran for miles and miles. While nighttime turned to day, he ran a long, long way. In the jingle jangle morning, he went slobbing along. But is he slobbing along fast enough? That's what I wants to know, thought Polly anxiously. Have faith, child, the spirit of the rainbow reassured her as if he could read her brains. And if you can't have faith, have a fruit chew. Hey, that reminds me, said Polly, fishing out the fruit chew of Babylon from her skirt pocket. I got this great gift what you gave me. Patience, child, said the spirit of the rainbow. The fruit chew of Babylon is powerful, but it must be used at just the right moment. For, as it is written in the stars, in special space ink, the fruit chew of Babylon will sort out the truth of it all. Whatever can that mean? wondered Polly, but the spirit of the rainbow would say no more. And on they rode in silence, racing desperately against time. Fruit chew, fruit chew, fruit chew. Overhead, morning was breaking as Jake rounded one last corner and a familiar sight met Polly's eyes. Boaster's Hill! She exclaimed happily. Boaster's Hill is what she actually said but I did it in a poly voice. Boaster's ill, she exclaimed happily. We're back home where we belongs. But her happiness didn't last long because something strange was happening at the bottom of the hill. As the heroes watched, a huge load of soil went flying everywhere. And then, in the blink of a tramp's eye, the goblins burst out from the hillside, spitting and dropping litter all over the place and designing cheap blocks of flats made of concrete. They had only been in Lamonic Bibber for about three seconds, but it was already starting to look like Goblin City. I think the goblins have won the day. Or have they? Find out next time in Storytime Chapter 12. I'll see you then. Take care. Go to bed. It's Sunday night. Go to bed.